Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, I thank you for this beautiful day. I thank you for each life that's here, each person who's listening and watching. Lord, we just pray that you would use this time to, to touch us, to reach inside, and help us to know you better. Mm-hmm. Help us be drawn to you and to know how much you love us and how much you care for us. And Lord, as, as Christmas approaches, Lord, let us remember uh, your greatest gift to us, your son. Lord, pray that you'd fill us with the Holy Spirit, and we pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy as a vessel to speak to each one of us, to encourage us, to share the gospel, to be edified this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, buddy. Go over there, would you? What a beautiful day we have, guys. Would you turn your Bibles to Galatians? We're going to continue our study. We're in chapter 5 at the end of the passage. Now, for those of you that weren't with us last week, we went over the, the walk that we're called to walk as Christians is one of the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit versus walking after the flesh. That's the terms Paul uses. The Spirit versus the flesh and I said last week, you know, sometimes we have to be careful. We might flesh out. That's when you uh, start walking after the things. Now, we saw last week, the deeds of the flesh, it said, are evident. There are things here we saw in the end. If, you, if you're um, just joining us, they're listed in Galatians 5, verse 19. He says they're evident. They're immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy. You know, we never have any of that, right? Outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envyings. Now, by the way, I'm not reading envyings like a typo. It's actually in there twice. That means it's double fleshly when you envy people. So, so it's in the list, but it's in there twice. Envyings is something that we just, it's part of our fleshly nature. And so Paul describes these things of the flesh. There's a few more he adds to it. You see in there in verse 21, he says there's also drunkenness carousings, you know, folks that go and carouse the bars, and that's actually your flesh. That's not the spirit. Don't try to pretend you're spiritual. I'm just going to cruise the bar, Pastor. You are not, uh, that's not the spirit. That's the spirit that comes from inside of a bottle, not the one called the Holy Spirit that we want to talk about today. And so he says, and, and things like these, that pretty much sums it up, doesn't it? Those are the things of the flesh, what the flesh is like. But Paul says, I warn you, I forewarn you, actually, that those that practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But, but is where we pick up today, but the fruit of the Spirit. Now, you guys probably have heard this part. It's one of the most taught parts of the book of Galatians. The fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one, the most important? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, peace, patience, kindness, right? Gentleness. There's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I skipped joy. Oh, how could I do that? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace. At this time of year, you can't skip joy. Joy to the world. My daughter would kill me if I skipped joy. <laughs> By the way, my oldest is named Joy. That's why I say that. She, she would not like that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things as these... There is no law. Now, we read this last week, but I told you I would come back to it because this is probably one of the most important parts for our spirit. For our spiritual nature, we need to be reminded that when you walk in love and joy and peace and patience with people, there's no rules. There's no law about your spirituality. Actually, you don't need to worry about what's the rules because if you're walking in love and and joy, and peace, and you have patience, you will actually fulfill the law naturally. The law is made to point out that we have a sinful nature. Paul says that it did its job when he writes to the church at Rome, and another discourse to the Corinthians, he talks about how the law, he says it was a schoolmaster. It taught him one thing. What did it teach him? Do you remember? He says this. He says the law was a schoolmaster, 
that taught him that he had sin. It, he, its whole job, I'm sorry, is it working there for you, son? The whole job of the law is that it, it's a tutor. It teaches you that you have sin. And if you don't think you have sin, just read the Old Testament, the, the, com the commandments, right? Can any of you make, I can't even make it through the first couple without, uh-oh, blew that one. That one didn't do that one perfect, you know. And it, it, it starts off with four commandments that are a, of the ten. In Exodus, you remember chapter 20 when Moses receives the ten commandments. Some of you may wonder if you see this in, in, in Hebrew uh, written, why on one side there's only four and on the other side there's six. And it's because the first four have to do with the relationship between us and who? And God. And the last six have to do with us and our fellow man. All the things down here, you know, thou shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Thou shall not covet your neighbor's stuff. Thou shall not lie. Thou shall, you know, th thou, thou shalt not kill. Those are all things that deal with us to people around us. But the first commandment is you should love the Lord with all of your what? All your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, the whole of your being. And he says, and, and God says, I'm a jealous God. You should have, how many other gods should you have besides him? None. That's the first commandment. Don't get any extra substitutes. Besides, they're not anything like the, the true and living God. You know, the gods that men make up of their, of their own religions, that's not the God we're declaring to you today. We're declaring the God that created us, the maker of heaven and earth. He made us and he says, I want you to be with me, in relationship with me. Now, the psalmist wrote, it's my sin that separates me from thee, O God. It's the thing that creates that, that feeling of God is far away. But is God really far away from us? No. The thing that makes it feel he is, is the sin in our lives. And so the Lord, the Lord sent his son, Jesus, to pay for that sin. And when Christ came, he said, he didn't come to get rid of the law, he came to fulfill it. Because the requirement of the law was that all sin had to be paid for by the blood of a perfect lamb. And that lamb was Jesus. Remember John the Baptist, behold, the lamb of God who, what? Takes away the sins of the world. Jesus came to take away our sins. Now, when Paul is writing this stuff, he's telling the, the churches, guys, let us, if we, if we say that we're Christians, you know, he said, let us not just talk that we are, but let us walk this walk that we talk. Let us walk in the Spirit. And if you're f not familiar with these things of the Spirit, this is the stuff that really takes your Christian experience to a new level. When you begin to learn to walk in the love of, of God. Now, this love is not the love. The first fruit of the Spirit listed here is love. But it's not the love that we use in English like, I love hamburgers. Or I love guacamole. Or I love my girlfriend or I you know when people tell me these things I I kind of laugh because in in the Bible days when this was written they were using Greek and in in Greek language is similar to Italian we have different words for love of different things like it's actually impossible to love a hamburger in Italian it was the weirdest thing to me when kids would be at, you know when I was young cuz I grew up speaking only Italian first then when I got to kindergarten I learned English and the kids would say, I love this. And they're pulling it out of their lunchbox. A Twinkie. I love this Twinkie. And I was like, you can't love a Twinkie? I mean, like, that doesn't even compute. You can say in Italian, it pleases me very much to eat this. You know, it's very, like, um, tasty and pleasing to my taste buds. And it's, it's wonderful to, you know, enjoy. But you, the word for love that, that w we use it is... Um, for love for a person, you know, how you love a person. And, and then there's a different love. There's brotherly love, a brotherly love where it's a love of all mankind. And we have a love for a, the pure love of God, unconditional love. Well, in Greek, it's the same way. The love of God has its own word. It's, it's an agape, or agapeos, but this, the tense that you pronounce in doesn't matter. Just remember, it's unconditional love. 
And in the book of Corinthians, some of you also know this is one of the most quoted passages. It describes that God love. The love of God is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If you turn there with me, this is a this is a, the passage, love is patient. Now, this is God's love. By the way, since we're talking about fruits of the Spirit today, I want you to do a little fun self-test with me. See how spiritual you truly are. You know, are you walking in the Spirit? We're going to check this because we're going to use this description. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 reads, Love is patient. Love is what? Kind. Love is not jealous. Love does not brag. It does, it, it, it's not arrogant, doesn't act unbecomingly. The kids always ask me, what's unbecomingly? Um, what, what's a good word for it in English? Like, I call it acting out, <laughs> like uh, drawing attention to yourself, making a um, big spectacle, or everyone look at me, look at me, and you act like a fool, and, or, or you do something stupid at the party. That's unbecoming, okay? Love does not do that. Love does not seek its own, it, and, and it's not provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It says love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And lastly, love never what? Never fails. Now, this is the love of God. But if you want to see how spiritual you are, I want you to do this with me. Just take your name and put it in place of the word love. We're going to find out how much growth we need to work on. Because if I read this, Izzy is patient. Izzy is kind. Izzy is not jealous. Right, Jan? Izzy does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecoming. I, oh, my gosh. How many areas are you going to hit me with, Lord? Izzy does not seek his own. He is not provoked. He does not take into account a wrongs. This was not written for Sicilians. <laughs> he does not, uh, no, does not rejoice in unrighteousness. That one I m pretty much can say I do not like unrighteousness. Iniquity is the old King James. Sin, when people are doing sinful things to other people, that irks me. So that one I got. Woo, one. <laughs> he does not, uh, 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 but rejoices with the truth. That I do too. Now, Izzy bears all things, Izzy believes all things. I'm putting my name in here, guys, but hopes all things, endures all things, and lastly, Izzy never fails. If you do this with your own name, you, I know you're laughing at me. <laughs> my pain, your gain, right? You get to see, do this with your own name. See what areas that you have to grow in in the love of God. Do we all have areas to improve on? This is a description, a really good description, of the unconditional love what God loves us with. But this is the love I aspire to love others with. And the very first fruit Paul describes to the Galatian church of the Spirit is this, by the way, if you do a little Greek study, you find it's this very love described in Corinthians is the love, the same Greek word, is used in Galatians chapter 5 for the very first fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of God's Spirit in your life is God's love coming out of your life. And God's love is like this. This is something that we want to have. Then the next fruit of the Spirit Paul describes is joy. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. All of these are fruits. Now, I don't know about you, but... Sometimes the new Christians ask me, they say, Pastor, you, you seem a lot more patient with people. How, how did you get like that? <clears throat> Just a quick question. Have any of you ever tried to consciously, you know, it, it's coming to the end of the year now. People kind of sum up their year. They take inventory. They, they do those things, what do they call them? New Year's resolutions. They're going to get all ready to be better next year than they were this year. So they kind of look over their lives. You know, I could work on a little bit more patience with people or a little bit more kindness yeah I, I you know some men will admit that yeah i could work on that and maybe i need a little bit more uh, you know um of these things what you're talking about those fruits of the spirit stuff and and it, i crack up because every year they come to me i'm pastor i'm gonna be more patient with my co-workers this year or i'm gonna be more kind to that 
jerk neighbor that I have down the street. And I'm going to, and, and they tell me they're going to do it. But they go about it in what I call the effort of the flesh to do it. Like, like they're going, I'm going to make myself be more patient with that person if it kills me. And I'm like, it's going to. It will. I mean, you just, let me explain something. These are called fruits of the Spirit. Fruit. He picked a really good description. Fruit. What is, yeah, have you ever seen a tree, a, a fruit tree? How, how many of you have seen orange trees, apple trees, you know, different fruit trees growing? Do you, as you pass past the apple orchard or the orange orchard, you, 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 do you hear the trees going, I'm going to bear fruit today if it kills me. And out comes the fruit. You know, they just strain and oh, I'm going to make it happen. They don't do that, do they? They just stand there in the orchard, just waiting. What are they waiting for, Maya? Their, their, their roots, whether you realize it or not, are down in the ground. They're not moving around. They're not dancing. They're not straining to make a fruit. They're simply staying put. In the old King James, it's called abiding, remaining where they're planted. Because for a tree to actually m make fruit, it needs to keep its roots down deep in the earth where it can absorb the nutrients that come to it. And it comes up the trunk and it just gets put out to the branches, to the tips, and it makes that little blossom. And then the blossom, the bees come, they pollinate it, and then it slowly, you know, conceives that little thing, and the petals fall off, and the little tip on the end that got pollinated, that slowly begins to grow. Now, I know this because I grew up in Arizona where we had a lot of orange orchards. And boy, that time of year when the, the orange trees are in blossom, it's like so fragrant. It just... But as kids, what we like to do was wait till it gets the blossoms, they kind of open, and then they curl back the, the, the leaves. They're white, and they have this little green thing that sticks out, and it has a little bit of, little bit of um, sticky stuff on the end. And it's sweet. <laughs> and we get in trouble with the farmers all the time because we used to pick them. You know, when the bees, after the bees pass by, they put this little pollen on them, and they get sticky, and you... You just pick the little center part, that little teeny green stick that sticks out of the middle of the flower, and you suck on it. It's like getting a little sweet honey candy. You know, it doesn't last very long, but it's got a little bit of citrus flavor to it, like a little orange honey candy. And we knew this as kids, man, that when it's blossom time, it's like candy, free candy, let's go to the tree. Well, <coughs> I'm not thinking of it from the farmer's point of view. Every little blossom that I pick... What did I just make him lose? That's an orange. It's not an orange yet, but it's the baby orange, okay? It's going to be an orange if I leave it alone and don't take it off the tree. And this is one of the principles that we read from Jesus. In John chapter 15, let me show you this. In John 15, Jesus was telling the disciples that he wanted them to bear fruit. But here's the trick to bearing fruit. It's a process. It's one where he explains the inner workings of it and how it works in our spiritual realm. Let me explain it here. John 15, verse 1. It says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Now, every branch that in me that does not bear fruit, he says, the father takes it away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it that it might bear more fruit. Now you, he says, are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So abide in me, he says, and I will abide in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. Now what's Jesus saying? We're the branches, he's the vine. If we don't stay connected to him, we won't get the nutrients through our branch to produce fruit. But if you take the branch away from the vine, it dies. And it will not become fruitful. It'll just be later, he says, it's good for only gathering up and putting in bundles and throwing into the fire. It becomes firewood. If it doesn't live and bear fruit, 
It is fruitless. And if you are fruitless spiritually, let me tell you, that's not a good place. Some of you will tell me, well, Pastor, I know we should bear fruit, but I don't really like having to love my neighbor and stuff. I, you know, they irk me. I'm like, sorry. I'm not the one who, who gave the commandment to love one another? Jesus did. God did. It's not new. You don't like the rules? Talk to him. Don't get mad at me. I'm just telling you what he said. In fact, it's in this very chapter. Let me show you. John 15, he goes on, he says, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch, as it dries up, and they gather them, he says, and, and, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, he says, ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done for you. Now, we just went over this with the youth group, uh, the college uh, group uh, this week. If we ask anything Jesus says, in whose name, his name, it says it, we will receive an answer so that our joy would be made what? Full. This is why at the end of our you know, time when we pray, we always say, in Jesus' name. We're not praying in his name, Father. We ask you these things because he gives us fullness of joy when we ask these things. And he's, he wants to answer us, but we have to come to him on his terms, he's the one that made only one mediator between us and God. And that one mediator is who? Who's the go-between? Jesus. No one else gets to fill the bill. Just Jesus. So if you, like in my Catholic upbringing, we were taught different saints were for different, pr you know. We, we had St. Christopher for travel mercies. We had St. Maria Goretti for the girls that wanted to, to have a baby. We had, you know, different patron saints for different things. And... We were kind of taught God was really busy, so you don't want to bug him personally. You, you, you tell the right saint, and then they know when the right moment is to slide into his office and put your petition in. Is that true? No. no. Somebody in business, somewhere along the way, came up with this thinking. They, they transposed their understanding of, of the business world and the, and the executive, the CEO, and the president of the company, and that they're busy, so... You ask the underling manager who will ask his upper, you know, superior, and he'll get, it'll slowly pass up. Forget that. There is not 10 steps to the top when we talk about getting to God. There's only one red phone, you know, one hotline, and it's Jesus. You pick it up and go, God, is that you on the other side? And he says, I'm here. And he says, you ask him anything. Jesus said, ask the Father anything in my name. You'll get an answer. Now, as the kids were, one of the kids was very, I was so grateful, Asani, she said, that doesn't mean he'll say yes. He could say no. Isn't that a great insight from a youngster, teenager saying, he could say no, but that's still an answer. You know, but he will give, sometimes that no is for your protection. Maybe you're praying, I want this thing, Lord, and the Lord goes, no. I'm not giving you that car. The brakes are junk you'll get in an accident i'll give you one that one they work or you know his no is not because he's uptight his no is because he sees everything and he knows what he has for you could be praying for a relationship with someone oh i'm so i want that person and the lord goes no you don't <laughs> see because we we judge by limited understanding we, we look at the outside there's a big problem with that we don't know how we're going to get along with that person, you know, when it's no one else is around and we're, you know, maybe they're great in public. You get them home and they burp. They break wind. You're like, oh, wow, I didn't know that about you. They didn't tell me that on the brochure. Forget it. You know, that's why I laugh about these things that they put on the computers with the dating. and say, How much do you really know about that person? I mean... They, they, and then you find out that they're, it's not even the person. Some old fat guy. <laughs> like, posing. They do that. It makes me just like, oh, come on. Praying to God is the best way to get your answer. And asking him in Christ's name. Now, I told the kids, I don't have to guarantee this to you. Jesus said it. Now, if Jesus said you ask anything of my Father in my name, 
and he will give, you will receive. Who's, who's putting the guarantee to the words? Jesus. And Jesus, he's teaching these disciples. He's here in John 15. Is not too much time from now before he's going to depart to go to the cross. And the parts here of John become very rich with things for our spirit. He says, listen to this, verse 8 of John 15. By this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. God wants you to bear these spiritual fruits. He wants you to have love and joy and peace and patience, kindness. He wants that in your life. Because when you bear these fruits, he says, you prove that, are, that you are really his disciples. You want to prove that you're following the Lord? Let him change you. Let him grow these fruits of the Spirit. Now, how do you get him to grow? It's easy. He says it right here. Let me read on. He says, just as the Father has loved me, Jesus says, I have loved you. Abide in my love. He says, if you, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Now, these things I've spoken to you that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy would be full. There's something great to a Christian that has fullness of joy. In fact, I have to say, honestly, they're probably some of my favorite people to be around. The people who have a fullness of joy about. You've been around Christians that have no joy? Anyone here? That, I didn't say if you were one. I just said, do you know one? Okay. It, anyone here know Christians? They say, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. Yeah. What's your problem? I'm like, I don't have a problem. You have a problem. Where'd your joy go? You know, you, your joy meter is pegged down on the bottom, on zero. No, it's minus. You have no joy. When you have no joy, there's a big problem. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is our what? It's our strength. And when your joy is gone, and by the way, can, can circumstances or life rob us of our joy? Can it sap us of that joy that we have? Yeah, that's why David, when David sinned with Bathsheba, do you guys remember? In Psalm 51, Verse 10, he prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a, a right spirit within me. Right? We sing that song. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Right? And renew a right spirit within me. And what's the next part? Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not, take not what? This is really important. Thy Holy Spirit from me. Can, you know, when you sin, the Spirit of God is quenched in your life. And some people, they'll say, I don't feel God's Spirit. I'm like, what sin are you in? Wait, how'd you know I was in sin? Because it's really easy. It works this way. When you sin, you feel God's Spirit depart from you. But David went on to say, Restore unto me what? The joy of my salvation. How many of you remember the day that you found out Jesus died for you? How good did you feel that day? That's called the joy of your salvation. And if you've never experienced that, let me, let me just explain. It's a simple thing for you to come to experience. You just need to know that when it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, he wasn't talking, like I used to think, yeah, God loves the world. That's everybody. Except I'm not included. I don't know why. I thought the world was all those other people. Not me. I'm the bad boy. I don't count. That's the, for the good people. And one day, one day, the Lord let my ears open. And I, and I realized, Jesus said, let those that have an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit says. The Spirit was saying, God so loved the world, and is he your included? And you know how he made me hear that? The preacher that was preaching said, if you were the only person, if Richard was the only person on the planet, sorry, Richard, I'll pick you. If he was the only one, would Jesus have still come and died? If Sharon was the only one, would he? And he did that, and 
It was a small group, and guess who he pointed out next? Me. If Izzy was the only one where Jesus has still died, and boy, I never thought of it that way. I always thought the world was all those other people. But when he went personally to me, if I was the only one, would Christ have still come? All of a sudden I realized the world was me included. And that day would come to be a day of that seed of faith putting in my heart. God was saying, I want you. I want you. I loved you and sent my son to die for you. And when that sank in, I can't tell you, but inside there was this joy I couldn't explain. It's like, I'm included. And I, I'm forgiven. The preacher said, everything. You're forgiven everything. Every sin, as far as east is from west. And I've been doing this with the kids because a lot of them are taking geometry in school right now. How do you draw infinity on a line? You make the line segment, right? You put a little arrow at this end. That means it goes on that way forever. And then you put another little arrow on this end of the ray. And that becomes now an infinite line shooting off it in opposite directions for infinity. It just keeps going. When, when the psalmist wrote, Lord, forgive me my sin. And the Lord's, the, the response was, as far as east is from west. In what? A straight line, not around the globe. In for infinity, forever. That's how far he takes my sin and removes it from me. He, he, the Lord just, I told the kids, he balls it up in a little, you know, crumple up that little sin. And now you got the Lord's pitching arm. He throws it, and that thing is gone for infinity. And, and when you go back to the Lord and say, Lord, forgive me for that thing, he goes, what thing? Because that sin you asked for forgiveness for just got sent on an infinite journey away from you. It will never be remembered again by God. You can come back later and have the guilt. So, oh, God, I'm so sorry. I know I asked you to forgive me this morning, but I just want to make sure. And you know what he's going to say to you when you come back? For that thing you already asked forgiveness? You go, what are you talking about? I already forgave you. It's gone. What the psalmist, another psalmist wrote, it is cast into the sea. I can visually look over there. The sea of what? What's it called? Forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Never to be remembered. When you say, God, forgive me, and he goes, done. It's done. Now, how do you feel inside when you hear that? How's your spirit? Man, my, yeah, relieved. <laughs> Man, that's good. We are clean. We are, we are forgiven completely. I was teaching the kids at the college and career last night. How much condemnation, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. How much condemnation is there for us now that are in Christ? None. Yet I know a lot of Christians walking around feeling condemned, struggling with things and not really realizing how complete God's forgiveness is and how much joy it brings us when the Lord forgives us that completely. It's a, man, what a joy that it's, it, it, it gives us strength inside beyond anything. It's the greatest thing, the joy of the Lord, the joy of our salvation. But see, David, when he sinned, he had to cry out to the Lord, Lord, oh, Make me have a right heart. Create in me a clean spirit. Restore unto me. Now this is interesting. Restore unto me the joy of thy salva salvation. You know, he forgot that sweet joy. And if you're a Christian living in sin, you're probably one of the most miserable creatures on the planet because there's nothing worse than a Christian. See, when you weren't a Christian and you sinned, you really didn't have a reason not to. You're just living your life after the flesh, and you know you do the best you can. Some of you are professional sinners, I call it. You are good at it. You would even boast about it. I'm a good sinner, man. I mean, I'm bad, but I'm good. I mean, I do it really well. I, I sin to the you know top degree of the meter. I don't just go a little bit. But when you came to Christ and asked Him to forgive you, and He said, "Let's do it now." 
in newness of life. Let's leave behind those old fleshly things and walk by the Spirit. If you do let go of those things and, and become new, how much joy is there for you? How much peace? How, how much? It's incredible. It's, a, it's undescribable. It's so, I can't put in words how beautiful it is, that feeling of, man, all that stuff that used to separate me from God, I can just, like, been there, done that, don't want the t-shirt, I'm done. Don't even remind me. I, I, that's my old life. I passed out of that life into a new life in Christ. And that's what, when we get baptized and you get, we call it symbolically burying them in the waters of baptism. We're laying you to rest like Jesus was buried. And you join yourself to him in the, in the likeness of his death in the waters of baptism. But you also join him in the likeness of his what when you come out? Resurrection. It, to be able to now walk in a new life, not all the, all, how many of the old things, after you get baptized, how many of those old things are still with you? They're gone. They're buried. Talk about a great way to start off your life anew. Get baptized. We got Phaedra wants to get baptized. One of the gals who was here, she had to leave to get on a plane, but she'll be back with us next week. She wants to, Sabina, she wants to get baptized. I'm just like, Lord, these people want the newness of life that you give. And it's a marvelous thing, guys. That new life is, is great that the Lord lets us walk in. But if you want to keep sinning as a Christian and kind of like live a little bit in the flesh and a little bit in the spirit, how, how, how good are you going to feel? I can tell you, guilty, condemned, I ain't doing what I'm supposed to, but I, you know, it, that, that life of compromising, the compromising Christians, they, they're the most miserable ones I know. And all I can do is say, if you can hear this, Ezekiel used to cry this over and over, 40 years this guy was crying out, and, and Jeremiah, his contemporary, Jeremiah, the, both of them had the same message from the Spirit. Come back to the Lord, you backslidden. Come ye out of your backsliding. Follow the Lord with a how much of your heart? A whole heart. Follow the Lord. Now this is what we want to do because, well, Jesus, let, let me just today, I want to end with what Jesus' command is out of John 15 because it's going to help us to become fruitful if we do it. He says, these things in verse 11 of John 15, I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be would be made full. And this is my commandment. Now, you guys, many of you know this verse, John 15, 12. This is my commandment that ye what? Love, love one another, just as I have loved you. How much did Jesus love us? He totally, he laid his life down for us. He died for us. How, how much should we love one another? That much? Jesus says this, greater, greater love has no one than this, that you, than that you would lay down your life for your friend. That's the greatest expression of love. And then Jesus says, you are my friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, was Jesus going to lay down his life for us? Yes. But he tells us we have to do what he commanded. Now, long, now he says, no longer do I call you slaves, for a slave does not know what his master is doing. But I have, I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father, I make them known to you. You did not choose me, Jesus says. I chose you. And I appointed you. Ordained is the old King James word. I, I made an appointment for you to do something an ordination that you should go and do what? Bear fruit. Be fruitful. He says, and that your fruit should remain. In other words, you don't pluck the little blossom off the thing before it grows. It's got to stay put. And that your fruit would remain and that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This I command you that you love 
one another. Now I'm so blessed because two weeks ago I got to share that portion what Paul wrote there to the church of Galatia about loving one another. Loving one another with not a, a fake insincere love, with a true love. That we're to do that. And 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 just the the pas the whole passage described how to do that, you know. How 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 much how long did we get to hold on to our anger if we were mad at someone? Do you remember the time limit? Till the sun went down, right? When the sun set, you had to let it go. And oh, there was conditions of, with our anger. We could be angry, but no sin. You can't use it as an excuse. Well, I'm mad, so I get to sin and punch him out. No, you can be mad, but you don't get to punch him out. You cannot use your anger as an excuse for your bad behavior. It doesn't mean you can't be angry about something. You just have to know. Now, I know that in some anger management courses, they teach you if you're even the slightest bit angry, you have a real problem. No, we were wired where we have hate, love, all of these emotions. But we were also gifted God's Spirit so that we could walk in the Spirit and not do the deeds of the flesh. And if we want to do this, I'm so blessed. I tell just a simple thing. Love one another. When Dylan edited it for the, the YouTube channel, he put the video of us having church on the beach, and he titled it, Love One Another. That thing has been seen over 2,500 times. In the just, just in, what is it now, Dylan, two weeks, two and a half weeks, that it's been on there. I'm so blessed. I mean, but it, do we need to be reminded? And I want to remind you today, Jesus did not say, this is my suggestion that you love one another. This is my, if you feel like it and maybe want to improve your spirituality, you could try this. No, what did he say? This is my commandment. If you are part of the, the followers of Jesus, it is not optional. It is not something you get to say, well, do I have to do it all the time? Can I maybe like have a momentary lapse and punch this guy out and then I'll love him later? I did that with my brothers and sisters and I'm like, how did it work out for you? You know, <laughs> I did that with my brothers. They don't even want to talk to me. It's not a good thing to do. I call that fleshing out. No fleshing out. Allowed. Stop. Walk in the spirit and do what Jesus commanded. Do it. Is it, is it really complicated, his commands? You know, when he says, oh, new commandment I have for you. 15 bullet points, right? No. One thing. Love one another. Just that's it. If you do that, you're doing what the Father sent him to tell us to do. He says, I came to tell you what my Father, I'm just here to tell you what the boss upstairs says, and he says, this is what you're supposed to do. That simple. Now, should we do that well, I mean, it's Christmas time, right? We're coming into the Christmas season. People are more, this is an easy message to give at Christmas time because people are a little bit softened up. You know, holidays, love, the, the Christmas music's playing. Well, at some places it is. When I was growing up, it played at every store I went to. Does anyone here like hearing Christmas carols when you go in? I love it. I, it makes me mad when they take them off now. It's like, look, we have to hear all the Halloween junk and all the... You know, but it is really Christmas time. Go ahead, play the Christmas carols. Remember, this is the time of year we celebrate the greatest gift ever given, the gift of Jesus to save us, to take our sins away. And that gives me great joy. It gives me great peace. And I want to share that with others. And he gave me a commandment. He says, you just abide in me. Stay with me. You know, just think, a bite means remain. I can't be the branch that jumps off the vine and says, I'm going to bear fruit on my own. I don't need the rest of those Christians. I don't even need Jesus. I'm going to do it without him. You cannot bear fruit without Jesus. He's the vine. You're just a branch. The only way your branch will bear fruit is if you stay plugged into Jesus. Period. There is no other religion that says, be plugged into Muhammad be plugged into Buddha. Be, th those were men. Even Buddha said, I, I'm, not the, I'm not God. 
He's dead. Jesus is alive. Buddha said, there is a God, and we should seek the way to God. Now, those... I've shared this many times, but I'm amazed at how many Christians don't know this. When did Buddha live? Like, just give me a round number, approximately. Anyone know? 400 BC. I'm rounding. It's like 389 to 4650 something. He didn't live that long. He 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 was before Jesus. I I say, share this because we have a lot of Buddhists on our island. And a lot of them are searching, and they're like, Buddha said to seek the way. And I said, you know, I think if Buddha would have lived after Jesus or during the time of Jesus, he would have become a Christian. And they said, why do you say that? I said, because it says right in John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life, and no one gets the Father but through me. And Buddha, the principal teaching of Buddhism, the very foundational teaching, is that look around at all of this design Somebody had to design that tree to, the, to make those leaves, to make that little fruit at the end, to draw those. those. He, was a, he would have been what we call a scientist today, you know, studying the, the, the stuff of, of how the interconnections in nature all work. Here. He was observant. And he says somebody had to make that. And they weren't just no average schmuck designer. He even writes, that designer is beyond anything of our understanding. And he calls the designer what? God. And he writes, if there be a designer that designed all this, then there must be a way to him. We must seek the way to him. That was his principal teaching. <laughs> Give me a true Buddhist any day. Because when they show up, you know what? All I have to do is say, you're a true Buddhist, you're seeking the way? And if they say yes, I go, I got something to share with you. Just turn them to John 14. L would you read this for me? Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one gets the Father except through me. And I've seen Buddhists just, like their face just, this is the greatest thing. Where did you find this? And I'm like, <laughs> been reading this book a long time. It's in here. But they're, it's new news to them. It's exciting because they, they weren't taught this book. And you can share that with them. If you meet a Buddhist, just ask them, are you a Buddhist? You know, just because they were raised in a Buddhist family and they went to temple once or twice, that doesn't make them what I call a true Buddhist. A true Buddhist is someone who believes the teaching what Buddha taught, who tries to live that teaching. That's a true Buddhist. If they're truly doing what Buddha said, they will be seeking for the way to the creator. And you get to come along and say, good news. You know that, that creator guy you're looking for? Let me show you in the beginning of my book here. In the beginning, this guy, the one you're trying to find, his um, Hebrew name is Elohim, God. He said, let there be what? Light. And he create, and you can read them in Genesis, you know, one to three, have fun with them if you want. But if you want to sum up, just say, look, the guy you're seeking for, I serve. And he's in the first chapter, and he's in the, all the way through this, all the pages of this book, and he wants you to be able to get to him. And if you're a true Buddhist, they'll already be going, their head will be nodding, yeah, yeah, I'm already trying, to, how do you do it? And that's when you can just turn to John 14, and I don't even read to him, I just say, here, would you read that? Just, just, just look right there at verse 6. Yeah. Let, let them see it and read it themselves. And you'll see that, that it's like the light comes on. Wow. The way to God. And the funnest part about sharing this with a true Buddhist is they share it with their Buddhist friends. You only have to like share it with one Buddhist, you get six or ten. You know, it's like, it's like, like uh, going to the donut shop and asking for one, you get a whole dozen. You know, just sharing the truth, it goes out. So let's share that truth at this time of year. And when people are wondering, is this Christianity thing really real? How do they know it's really real? What did Jesus say? They will know when we bear what? Fruit. 
when your life has love and joy and peace and patience with people, you know when you're patient with people and you're kind to people, they look at you like there's something different about you. How do you do that? How do you put up with that guy? How do you put up with that person? That person's a jerk. And you know it's the fruit that God has worked in you. May you all abide in Jesus this week. And may he make you bear. You don't have to strain. You can't strain. I don't go, I'm going to be more patient. <laughs> don't worry, you'll freak everyone out. They'll be like, it doesn't work that way. Just keep going to Jesus. Jesus, I'm back. Give me what I need for this day. And he will develop in you love for people. He'll develop in you patience with people. He'll make those fruits grow out of you. And you will wind up having people around you say, wow, there must be a God. Look at the, the characteristics, the qualities. Those they, they use all different words. They don't call them fruits of the Spirit. They just call them like good qualities or, or really nice, you know, to be around or yeah, that's fruit of spirit. Tell them what it is. And let them enjoy. Now next week, we're going to go on. Uh, I'm, I wrote in the bullet times, apologize to read the next chapter of Galatians, but I, but it, I forgot. Next week is the Christmas service. So if you have friends who only go to church, I call them the once a year, twice a year, you know, Christmas and Easter friends, but they will go. Don't, don't diss them. Just bring them. And next week, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sharing from the Gospels of Matthew, the first chapters, and the Gospels of Luke. I'm going to jump back and forth to, to do the Christmas gift of God's Son to us, the true meaning of Christmas. So <laughs> it's kind of funny when people come, they say, this preacher, he always preaches the same thing every time I come here. <laughs> I know how long it's been since you've seen me. Okay, because... <laughs> I teach all different messages through the whole year, and they come back at Christmas, and they're like, he's on the same thing he was on last year. Is it because this is an important thing, okay? So next week, if you'd like to read ahead, please read Matthew, the first two chapters, and Luke, the first two. Luke 1 and 2 and Matthew 1 and 2 are really good. And if you have a chance to read these with your kids or your grandkids about the time when Jesus was born, this is you'll spot it right away. When you start reading there, you'll see... This is the description of that, of that gift of God's son as a baby. And it, for me, it was really, I don't know, being brought up. Uh, we loved Christmas time. My mom, she, she got the little, the little nativity set, and she would set it all up. We had the good set. It had the little, the little um, what's it called, manger? The little, no, the little uh, trough with the, with the little straw in it. And the baby Jesus, ours was detachable wasn't like stuck to it he, he was separate and my mom would set up the whole thing leading up to to the christmas eve but she wouldn't put jesus out and then on the night you know when we went to bed he wasn't there but when we woke up on christmas morning he, she like did you notice anything we we're like baby jesus is here you know and i know it sounds fun but when you're a child does that help you learn the story yeah and I know some people, they're very uptight. No, we don't do that. That's idols and that's this. Listen, it helped me learn about God's gift of his son. That simple little thing. You know, we used to wait for the little baby Jesus to be there because we knew that was, we were remembering what God did. And we'd play Christmas carols and sing them and just, you know, it was a special time. Don't squash that for your friends that, you know, this is a, this is a, and then the people who don't have family around, we want you to know you got family right here in the Lord. You do. And you, and you know, you, if you're feeling like you don't have anywhere to go, you, you, look, you just, the Bible says in the old King James, if you want to have friends, John Higgins taught me this verse. He said, show yourself to be what? Friendly. friendly. Yeah. Be a friend. Don't go, well, I don't have any friends. <laughs> What's wrong with this church? Nothing wrong with the church is you. You got an unfriendly attitude. Check it at the door. We we don't have a door, but leave it in the parking lot over there. Okay? When you come here, show yourself to be friendly. You might wind up going and having Christmas dinner with one of your brothers and sisters in Christ right here, and it could turn out to be the best Christmas you've ever had. But we need to be walking in the spirit. 
and doing what Jesus said, and he said, love one another. So let's do that. And let's let people see that fruit in our lives. And that will let them know we're truly Jesus' disciples. So that's all I got for you this morning. Next week, the birth of the Lord. Read ahead, and we'll get back together and enjoy it. Let's, uh, let's close with prayer, shall we? Father, thanks so much for the time, what you give us here. Thank you for the beautiful day, the nice breeze, Lord, that we had today. So, I am so grateful. It's not summertime anymore. This nice, this nice winter cool breeze. And for all of our poor brothers and sisters in Alaska and Canada <clears throat> that don't know our cool breeze means 68, not minus 38. We pray for them, Lord. Give them grace while they're stuck inside. And be with us, Lord. Let us bear much fruit this week for you. Ask it in Jesus' name. And everyone that agree with me said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo and God bless.